Okay, thanks. So yeah, uh, I want to just talk with you about uh, usability and evaluation in particular. Although after this morning's talk, I realized that I need to change the title of my talk from usability to usomics. Mainly, uh, I'll probably be talking mainly to those of you who are uh, tool builders. Uh, I guess this audience is kind of neat because we have people who are sort of both tool builders and tool users at the same time and even uh, together. Uh, so mainly I'm going to speak to the tool builder half of you. Uh, the other half of you, the tool users, uh, well, um, first of all, I'm going to refer to you, those of you who are biologists, as users. I hope you'll forgive me for that terminology. There's only two fields of endeavor in the world that refer to their main constituents as users. One is usability, the other is drug dealing. So, you know, I'm not trying to insult you, it's just the first phrase we have. Okay. So first of all, when I talk about, I want to dispel some myths about usability and what it is. First of all, I want to, you know, there's a myth out there that, that, visibil that usability is voodoo science of some sort. That is, how do we know if something is usable? Well, we look at it and we say, that's cool. It, it must be usable, right? Uh, we say it's user friendly or we say it's uh, intuitive, uh, phrases like that. Those things have no meaning to them. There's no, there's no teeth, there's no meat to those. Uh, so I wanna, I wanna move away from that and, and, and I wanna try to convince you today that, that actually usability has a science to it. And just like any other science, it's a, it's a thing that we measure. Uh, usability and visualization, you can think of it as, you know, the phenomenon we're, we're examining in this case is a user in front of a visualization. That's, that's the, the natural phenomenon that we're observing. And what we want to do, be able to do is measure things about that phenomenon and then be able to you know, model things about that so we can uh, perhaps do better at it. So the, the trick there is that we gotta come up with ways to measure this phenomenon. That's one of the main things I wanna talk about today. Uh, so I just wanna sort of throw in an analogy to the science of biology. It seems to me that, uh, that biology research really took off when good measurement capabilities were created. Things like gene arrays and all the stuff we've been seeing for the last couple of days. When we got the ability to do lots of measuring, suddenly we got the ability to do a whole lot of biology, right? I think it's the same in usability. If we, we're, we're still in this sort of pre-microwave phase of usability. We haven't got to that sort of you know, way of, of really doing a lot of measuring and usability, but we do have some, some measurement techniques. I'm gonna tell you about those. I wanna kinda of try to inspire you to think of some better ways to measure this phenomenon. We can complete the cycle and think about this from the, user, uh, the engineering uh, perspective. So usability engineering, if you, look, if you pick up any introductory textbook to usability engineering, you'll see a diagram that looks kinda of like this, the, the, the wonderful four phases of usability engineering. Uh, we always start out with our requirements analysis and go around from there. Two things I want you to notice about this. One is that this is a user-centric process. Uh, in other words, each of those stages involves the user, especially stages one and four. We begin and end with the user. Uh, also, this is an iterative process. We never get this right the first time around. The first interface you create is not gonna be usable. And so we gotta, we gotta try again and again uh, by evaluating it. Oh, but I guess the point I want to make here is that getting away from the voodoo thing, that there is a rigorous engineering process we can undertake to accomplish usability. Okay, myth number two. There's the perception that usability is only about learnability. That is, usability describes how well I can learn, how quickly I can learn an, an interface I've never seen before. This kind of comes out of the phenomenon of, of usability being applied to the web, and that sure, on the web, most of your website visitors are gonna be people who have never been there before, and sure, the main goal is to enable people to, to understand that website quickly and easily. But we wanna go beyond that in, in, in visualization and biology. Uh, so just a simple example. Um, uh, remember the old, you know, before Google Maps came out, maps used to work like this where we had these really clunky interfaces, where you had to kind of click here to page over to the right and click here to page over. Okay, so that's not about learnability. That's easy to learn. Google Maps is easy to learn. But the difference between Google Maps and that is that Google Maps is much faster to use. 
It's more about performance and not so much about learnability. In other words, when you're interacting with a, a, a map in Google Maps, you can do it very quickly. You can get the answers you want quickly. You can, you can grab that map and drag it around and get from point A to point B and, and, and figure things out. Whereas here, the clunkiness of the interface is, is actually slowing you down, having to press these buttons and it goes too far and then all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I want you to think about it's not just that I can learn the interface, but that when I actually go to use it to do something, it enables me to do it with greater performance. Okay, even, even after I'm an expert. Okay, so beyond learnability and to performance. Myth number three, usability is just about simple task performance. So if I buy that it's about performance, well, gee, sure, I can click that button on the map and get there eventually, right? And so it takes me an extra second and a half to do it, and the old map says it does in Google Maps. Big deal, second and a half, so what, right? The other thing I want to try to convince you of here today is that that, that will affect more than just the second and a half of time it took you to do that. It actually affects your ability to think about the problem you're trying to solve. In other words, these things will have, the, the clunkiness of the interface will have impacts on, on, on cognition, uh, on your user's ability to think about, think deeply about hard problems. Uh, so here's a, just a simple, ex uh, a quick example. I'll get more into this later. Uh, we did a study, for example, that compared uh, spot fire to gene spring. And now I, I gotta sort of be in all fairness to my friends from Agilent. This is gene spring before Agilent bought it and fixed it, okay? Uh, um, and what we found, we did a study where we actually tried to measure uh, what people learn from using these two interfaces and in, in doing uh, analysis of gene expression data. And I'll tell you more about how we did that later. But what we were able to show is that when people use spot fire, they were able to gain more insight. They were able to learn more than they were from using GeneSpring. And why is that? Well, it boiled down, really, to the clunkiness of the interface. If you ever use Spotfire, it's a very clean interface. Uh, it came out of the visualization research. Uh, the interaction is very smooth and clean. The main thing is the dynamic query widgets, right? And that's, that's uh, uh, um, uh, smoothly dragging those sliders, uh, uh, filtering your information in and out. Uh, there's uh, all the uh, views in Spotfire interact in the same way. Uh, they're all very consistent, so you know, no matter which visual representation you're using, whether it's parallel coordinates or scatter plot, the interaction is all basically the same. You go over to GeneSpring, and it's, it's kind of the other way around. There's, there's uh, <coughs> each uh, visual representation has uh, different interaction techniques. You get confused about how to interact with each one. Uh, when you want to do things, you got to go through multiple dialog boxes to get to get the effects you want. Uh, so, you know, the technical term clunky uh, is, a, is a way to describe that. Uh, but that clunkiness of the interface actually had an effect on their ability to think about their, their problems and actually learned less about the data uh, because of that. And this is not in a time pressure situation. They could think about this as long as they want. It wasn't just about it took a second and a half longer. It was that it actually affected their ability to think about the problem. <clears throat> and so they, they thought less because of the clunkiness of the interface. So that's the impact that the usability of your tools can have on your users. Now I want you to just sort of process that for a minute. They're not affecting people's ability to think. That's a little bit of a scary thought, in fact. Uh, okay, and, and the final, I guess, myth is that, that usability is very expensive. And in fact, there's all kinds of research on this, and all of it says that in a production kind of environment, if you do usability, you'll save a ton of money. For example, if you spend, the, the, the disks are like, if you, if you spend a dollar on usability up front in a project, you'll save 10 to $100 uh, later in the development of the project. That's more of a sort of production kind of argument. It's less compelling to me than this third one, which is about really about uh, the ability for <coughs> biologists to think deeply about the problems they're trying to solve. Okay, so th th I just wanted to dispel those things, those myths about usability so we really know what we're talking about. Um, now let's get back to the process of usability engineering and talk about how that works and how it's being applied in uh, visualization and biology. It's, it's fairly new, actually, to visualization biology. There's not a, a huge amount of work uh, already applied in this particular domain, but we can certainly draw from what's being done in, in other areas of visualization and user interfaces in general. Uh, so let's start out talking about this, this phase one of, of analyzing user requirements. Ben did a great job of talking about phases two and three, designing and developing 
uh, yesterday, so I'm going to focus on phases one and four, the analyzing and the evaluating. Uh, let's just talk about uh, requirements analysis for a minute. So the goal here is, is when you start a project, and the first thing you want to do is understand the users and their tasks. And you want to do this in a, in a, in a, in a, in a rigorous and a, in a deep way. Uh, the way we typically go about doing these things is through a process we call ethnography. Uh, this is a term borrowed from sociology, and really what it means is be a fly on the wall in the biologist's office. <laughs> you want to observe, and, and your goal is to really get inside their head and understand their thought processes. And if you can do that, then you can start thinking about how to design tools that support those thought processes or optimize those thought processes. Um, and, and so sometimes we refer to that as a cognitive task analysis, and that's to kind of distinguish it from what you might think of from like the human factors realm, where uh, uh, people are doing sort of physical tasks. Here, the things we're observing is people doing mental tasks. It's much harder to observe. How do you get inside somebody's head? Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty challenging. Um, the really hard part about doing this is when you first start doing this, you're going to find an easy problem to solve. And you're going to say, oh, that's, I can solve that. There, there's a need, right? The tricky thing here is finding the hidden problem behind that obvious problem that you think you need to solve. Because what you're really going to find is that, uh, well, let me just give you a story. Uh, so a long time ago, when I first started getting into this, uh, gene expression was a new phenomenon. Uh, working with some, some biologists, helping them sort of uh, deal with this, this new kind of data. So we talked with them, and they, they sort of had this idea of, you know, scatter plots can help me, right? Uh, so we can display our gene expression data in scatter plots, and we can see the change versus the significance level and all that kind of stuff. And uh, sure, we can build scatter plots. We're, 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 we're good at that. Uh, <coughs> the more we worked with them, the more, uh, the more feedback we got, and the more, uh, gee, we really, uh, I don't know, it's not quite right. We need to do more with these scatter plots. Can we add? Uh, filters for a level of significance here, so I can filter out things based on things like that. Can I color code? Can we, uh, so we keep adding all these things, and we feel like we're stuck. We're not getting anywhere. Why is this? Well, and so eventually we came to the realization that it's not, it's actually not this thing about the scanner plot that they're worried about. They think that's what they're worried about, but what they didn't, what they, what they sort of couldn't verbalize to us and what we didn't see at first is that what they're really worried about is how this connects to all the other kinds of data, right? And so what we really wanted to do is go in and connect it into gene ontologies and other kinds of databases and so on, enable that kind of rich interlinking. And of course, everybody knows that now that's commonplace and everybody's doing that now, but at the time that was sort of like a new thought. Uh, and so the reason this is hard is because if you just go and ask them what do you need, probably the answer you're going to get is actually going to be wrong or too simplistic. And, I, and I'm not saying that to be like mean to, to the users, right? I'm saying that because the users are, uh, they're busy thinking about biology. They don't have time to be sitting around thinking about what kind of tools they need and how to design a visualization that would help them. It's just not their thing. It's sort of the thing they think that visualization can help them with. But what they haven't thought about is the fact that visualization can help them think about these much greater things. And so that's where you got to get inside their head and start to recognize those bigger opportunities for visualization and find that bigger problem behind the, the, the first kind of simple problem. Uh, so I think that's what's hard about this. Uh, so uh, some, some, uh, some required reading for you. I'm going to assign this to you right now as tonight's homework assignment. You got to go and read um, Paroli and Card's uh, paper on the analytic process. Uh, it's called The Sense-Making Loop for Analysts. This, they, they did a cognitive task analysis of analysts. And now this is actually done in another domain. This is in the intelligence analysis domain. But a lot of it, I think, carries over to uh, biology and doing, uh, uh, biologists doing science. Uh, so they, they did a, a task analysis, fly on the wall observation of what analysts do. And they, they developed this model from, from those observations. Uh, it's the model of, of sense making. And so just a couple of things to notice about this. First of all, what we realize is that the analytic process here is perhaps bigger than we think it is. Uh, it covers a lot of things. 